morning, good morning to our online viewers. We are so happy that you can join us this morning on another Pastor's Corner. We pray that by God's grace that you have been having a wonderful morning thus far. And as we commence so even another Tuesday of Pastor's Corner, I just want to um, alert you or inform you to invite a friend, invite a family, and let them know. Call someone, call your neighbor, and let them know that Pastor's Corner is on this morning. And the topic is an exciting one, so I know that you would, you would gain an experience that would help you and that would um, stimulate your, your, your mind as it relates to what we will discuss this morning. So we just want to thank you for coming on this morning, and I pray by the grace of God that you and your family and your friends would have a wonderful experience as we discuss our topic this morning. And our topic is Reverie and the Christian. A revelry and the Christian. Friends of mine, we are living in the carnival. We are experiencing uh, the carnival festivity. And today we are about to talk some things about the revelry and what is taking place among and the, or the atmosphere here in Grenada. So we thank you for viewing and call your friends, call your, call your son, call, call your daughter, your, your grandmother, your grandfather, and let them know that the pastor's corner is on uh, this morning. And with me this morning are two wonderful scholars. Um, they are great men for Jesus. And I know that they will do an excellent job as we discuss this morning on this in this pertinent topic. And I'll just allow them to um, introduce themselves. We'll start to my far this left, a wonderful scholarly young man. Pleasant good morning to everyone. Thank God for life, for health, and for strength. And I am Pastor Lyons. And pray by God's grace that we're going to have a wonderful experience with him and also with you. Good morning, everybody. Greetings, and um, let me say welcome to another installation of Pastor's Corner. We are always happy to have you tuned in, and um, well, I'm Pastor George, and I'm happy to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Pastor Lyons and Pastor Eustace George for joining us this morning. Before we proceed, why don't we bow our heads as we pray. Almighty and eternal Father, we thank you, Lord, in a very special way for this wonderful opportunity where we can be on Pastor's Corner on another Tuesday morning. We pray, Lord, that your divine presence would be with us and be with those, those who are viewing online. And I pray, Lord, as we discuss, that we'll continue to grow in our wisdom as it relates to our behavior and how we have to act as your people. So thank you, Lord, and may you guide this morning's proceedings in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Yes, our discussion topic is this morning is rivalry and the Christian. Rivalry, sorry, and the Christian. And today we have a uh, first question, pastors. I, 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 I think that is a, is, a, is a good question, although it can be for some a hard question, but it's a good question. It says, what exactly is revelry? Uh, can you share a working definition for our discussion today? All right, allow me to begin. One of the internet sources says, lively and noisy festivities, especially when these involve drinking a large amount of alcohol. So that's one of the, the definitions that we can find from an online source in relation to revelry. All right, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, Pastor Fan, so I must say that um, one of the things that I like about Pastor's Corner, it deals with relevant um, topics. Yes. And we would know over here in Grenada we are in the carnival season. Mm -hmm. So almost everywhere you pass, it's a stage, you know. Um, and this morning we deal we, we deal with revelry, and we we must define it to understand the factors and the implications surrounding it. It has to do with boisterous festivity. It has to do with noisy partying. Revelry has to do with um, situations where people are participating in drinking and dancing and singing it is um partying on a public level mm -hmm. especially in a noisy way revelry is not a silent event when people are reveling they are not silent about it they are not quiet about it it is loud it is a situation that can be seen and um can certainly be heard it is it is partying in a loud manner that is revelry Okay, thank you so much, um, Pastor George, as he emphasized and concur with Pastor Lyons. Um, and usually, as we, as we look around Grenada, we can see a lot of things are happening. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised, even a couple Sundays or a couple Sundays ago, where I, where I am living, Ella, I couldn't sleep the night. Uh, when I got up the morning, it was still 
a challenge because the noise was so great. And while leaving home to go on an um, on errand, on one errand, I, I, I had to toot the horn over and over in the road so that they can move to go on the side. And so this, this discussion this morning is, is really important. And it can help us to know where we stand as Christians and how we ought to behave. And if we should, what well, we should not partake as well in this activity as so, it relates to the topic this so, morning. So, Pastor, even as Pastor George would have mentioned what's taking place in Grenada now, and we are operating with a working definition, mm -hmm. we can also put our context into the definition that yes. was already established and also see that it is not just, okay, the partying and the drinking, but everything Absolutely. that comes into play when that stage is set up and the music starts, the behavior of the people, mm -hmm. the way they gyrate and they, they connect themselves to God and, and, and the, the robbing and the friction and the, the, the sense of excitement that they feel, all that falls into the context of reverie. Because it tells us that they are exhibiting a certain level of behavior. Yes. And that is, what, that is what defines revelry in this context. Especially in our current situation of festivities. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Pastor. You are so correct. Um, I just want to invite my friends to um, also to share and like the page. And let your friends and your family know that the pastor's corner is on. And they too can be a part. But the only how they can be a part if you call them and remind them to log in, to tune in and share and like the page so that your friends on Facebook and YouTube as well can also be a part of our discussion this morning. So, Pastors, um, do you think there can be healthy, listen, healthy or wholesome revelry? Or shouldn't Christians be allowed to enjoy themselves as well as others do? So, do you think, Pastors... There should be that um, reverie is healthy. Do you think there are some wholesomeness to it? Um, do you think that the Christian can partake and enjoy? Can, do you think Christian can drink a little thing too? And go on and dance somewhere else too and where the stage is built? Talk to me, pastors. Talk to me. Well, based on the definition that we established this morning for um, what is reverie, there cannot be wholesome nor healthy okay. reverie. Because when you look at it, you'll understand it's not a Christian thing. Okay. So it cannot be, it cannot be wholesome, it cannot be healthy for the Christian. Um, you look at scripture, and this is another thing that I like about Pastor's Corner. We don't just come here and talk. We talk, and we always refer to the one rule of faith, that is the Bible. Um, when you look at scripture, of course you would not find God saying, you know, thou shalt not have fun. He doesn't say that. But God expects us, while we enjoy life, we do it in a particular way. So Christians are not called to be boring people. Christians are called to have joy, to, um, you know, to live an enjoyable life, but in a particular way. And you know, we have to ask the question, what does it really mean to enjoy life? And so having a good time is not a sin. It's not a sin to have a good time. You know? But we must pay attention to the principles that God has laid out for us. Um, with regards to godly living when we engage in, in leisure activities. You look at the Bible and we find in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, and whatever, whatever, whether it is eat, drink, leisure time, family time, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. So, so even when we are relaxing, where we choose um, to entertain ourselves, what entertainment we choose um, to have fun, we should always make sure that these activities are not just pleasing to self, but pleasing to God. And I think that is, is fundamental. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor George. Pastor Lyons? Well, when we look at the, the question, you use the word healthy. And uh, when I think of health, I think about temperance. Yes. And usually, revelry takes into play persons who spend a long time in dancing. So whether it's 12 o'clock, whether it is a whole night, it doesn't matter. And uh, you say wholesome. So 
That, that is not temperance, that's intemperance. So that can be healthy in the first place. <laughs> and if we are indulging in alcohol, substance use and abuse, which damages the body, that can be healthy. True, yeah. So sleep deprivation is not healthy. Consumption of substances that damage the body, not healthy. And those same substances, they alter the mental state. Yeah. That can be wholesome. That breaks you down. Yeah. So just those two words there, when you take them into perspective, it tells you that something's already wrong with the picture. So you can't, a Christian cannot have healthy, wholesome revelry. That is fighting against itself. Yes. And it just cannot work. Yeah. And also, Christians operate within boundaries. When God established his people, in Exodus 20, he gave them laws that they should be governed by. And those laws also protected their living. Mm -hmm. And it also expressed their love to God and their love for their fellow men. Yeah. So we can have fun, but it must be within, as was mentioned, principles. Yeah. There must be boundaries and parameters within which we are operating. And even persons who engage in revelry, they would say, or reveling, they say, well, we're having fun. We enjoy ourselves. Let go yourself. Loose yourself. Do what you want. Freedom. Yeah. But even freedom, freedom is within certain confinements. Yeah. Freedom is not doing what you want. There must always be boundaries that protect and guard the individual. Because once we go against, once we exceed, then it becomes abuse. And that abuse can lead to some detriment to self or to somebody else. Yeah. So the Christian can have fun, but it has to be within the, concept, the context of those principles that would guard against going overboard when it comes to behavior. And 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So some persons would ask, would God be pleased with what you're doing now? And that's something we always have to take into consideration, that God is, is always present. present yeah. He's seeing, he's looking at what we are doing. So the question is, of course, it's a question for self. When I do that, and I know that God is watching me, how do I feel about it? Do I just say, God, well, that's your business. But remember, he gives life. And he takes life away. Yeah. So I need to respect my God. I need to respect God too. So as a Christian, I cannot see us having healthy, wholesome revelry. That goes against itself. But we can have fun. Like over the weekend, we had national sports. And we went over to Cotbert Peters Park. And we had football and cricket and basketball and running. And persons enjoy themselves. So you are able. We can. But outside of that, where abuse of substance and alcohol and so forth comes into play, then that goes against what we believe and the word of God that we stand upon. Amen. Wonderful. And we have some comments. Yulin Alexander saying, Amen, Pastor Lyons. Um, uh, Travis Hall is saying, it's an oxymoron. Um, Yulin Alexander is saying that I'm um, walking the street and you can, and you, can, and you call that enjoying yourself. Lord, have mercy on the people. Lord, have mercy. Sister um, Veronica Lashman says, good morning to all pastors and all, and to all who are viewing this program. Blessings to you all. We have, again, Travis Hall saying healthy. Reverie is like saying healthy sin. Um, we have someone again, Sister Alexander is saying carnival and this reveling thing that is devilish, she says. Um, and we thank you so much for your comments, and we thank you so much for being a part of our discussion this morning. You can continue sharing your thoughts as we discussed as it relates to reveling and the Christian. And it's important for us to understand one of those biblical principles that a Christian should live by and always remember that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if our bodies belong to God, Pastor George, you will not put alcohol in your body. If your body belongs to God, Pastor Lyons, you will not... You will not um, Cause your body to be in certain strain as you release, so not sleeping for two and three days, and it, it put 
pressure and it adds stress and therefore you are deteriorating the temple that God has given you. And we should always remember that, that we don't belong to ourselves, we belong to God. And whatsoever we do with our body, make sure it glorifies God. And as Pastor George and Pastor Lyons are alluding to all year round, there we can have good fun. As some people can think Christian life is no, Christian life is not a boring life. We can have good fun and we do have good fun in Jesus' name this morning. Yes. Um, Pastor Francois, I just want to add, um, you know, to emphasize the point that Christianity and reverie stands on two opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. And I'm sure that we would better understand that as we discuss the subject this morning. Um, there are two totally different nature, to put it that way. And you cannot mix the two. You understand? If you try to find a balance between the two, you're mixing what should be Christian with what is opposite to Christian. And that in itself, God cannot be pleased with that. So I really want us to get to, to get the point that there can be no wholesome or healthy reverie. Anytime you are playing a participatory um, role in it, it is in direct contradiction to what God expects of us. Yes. Sure. Wonderful. Thank you, Pastor George. Um, Question number three, what is a lasciviousness or lasciviousness? Um, how is it connected to reveling? Um, it's important for us to understand, just define what is lasciviousness. And we ask, we will discuss after how it is connected with reverie. Pastor Lyons, you want to go? All right. So, lasciviousness, when I go, let's go to Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Mm -hmm. And within those verses there, we have words such as adultery, fornication, uncleanness, idolatry, hatred, wrath, envying, drunkenness, and we also have a, a left lasciviousness for the last that I'm going to call. So notice the kind of words that lasciviousness mm -hmm. is connected with. It tells you already that there is, there is a negative connotation to the word. Mm -hmm. And based on what I understand about lasciviousness, it speaks to a lustful sense of lewdness and wantonness. In other words, there is this immoral sexual connotation yeah. that resonates with the word lasciviousness. And Paul, later down in the same chapter, speaks of these words, which also include lasciviousness, as vain. Mm -hmm. And if something is vain, then it means that it is yet contrary to what God expects of us as Christians. In other words, we are doing it with no positive reward. It is wasting time. Yes. Wasting our lives away. So, lasciviousness speaks to that sexual kind of arousal and, and connotation that individuals experience in those settings and environments. It speaks to that sexual part of it. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Pastor Lyons. Pastor George? Yeah, I think Pastor Lyons did a very good job in speaking to the the question of what is that seriousness and how it's connected to reveling. Um, as he mentioned, it has a lot to do with a loss. It has a lot to do with um, a strong desire for sexual activity. It has a lot to do with um, the arousal of sexual desire. And when we consider lasciviousness, which is, as was stated, the desire for sexual activity and reverie, um, reverie, reverie is, is a situation, as we mentioned before, where people get on. Yeah. They get on, and Pastor Lyons mentioned a word earlier, um, gyrating. You see a lot of that in um, reverie. And that in itself builds the, the strong urge and desire for sexual arousal, which is lasciviousness. So that is that's the connection there. And um, it has to do with a complete disregard for not only oneself, but for others. Somebody's asking how. Um, it is seen people as objects, you know, sexual objects, um, and having 
this desire for sexual activity outside the confines of marriage. Um, we see a strong example of lasciviousness in the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is what, this is what um, the Bible says. Even in the New Testament, it, it refers to Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, um, 2 Peter 2, verse 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. I, I really want us to take note of that text. Yeah. It says that God looked at Sodom and Gomorrah and he said, okay, I go deal with them. Turn them into ashes. And then scripture says, he set there an example for those who would come after and choose to live ungodly. And we want to establish and we want to be plain and direct this morning because we live in a world where people um, come through with concepts and ideologies that are far from what God expects of us. And they come straight. Sell it to our children straight. So we want to make it clear this morning. Revelry is ungodly behavior. Yeah. And when we look at scripture, God deals, he always deals with those ungodly behavior that human beings choose to participate in. And so, yes, it may be a popular thing, especially for our Caribbean people. It may be a popular thing to, 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 to run the streets annually, you know, and, and make noise and get on and revel along the place. It may be a popular thing, but we must understand, and as Christians, we must make a certain call to our community that God will deal with these ungodly behaviors. He will. And as allow me to express a thought that in as much as this topic is an exciting topic, it can also be one where persons can feel offended. Yes, yeah, true. Yeah. But we have to recognize that what we are doing here this morning is we are addressing issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, persons may not feel comfortable with the discussion, but what we are doing is expressing the thought, the facts, the truth, and if you fall into that category, so for example, you ask me, what is stealing? And uh, I give you a definition of stealing. So if you know that you took something that does not belong to you, then automatically that means that you would have stolen something from somebody. So change. that puts you within that context. Yeah. And you might feel offended by that. But what we are doing here is not saying you are a sinner and you are a thief. We are Stating the truth. Yes, yes. And right. uh, what we expect individuals to do, if you fall in that category, then by God's grace, Amen. see what God expects of you and make the changes. Amen. So we're speaking about lasciviousness and the sexuality that comes with it. And I believe that as human beings, sometimes we try to fool ourselves. Yes. And I cannot for a moment understand how we can try to fool our own selves. In other words, look how, look how I am dressed. Look at how you all are dressed today in jacket and tie and so forth. But when it comes to revelry, whether it is culture or something that people love, look at the, the dress code. They don't dress like this. I mean, when you look, when you look at the, the different costumes nowadays, they, have, they, they depict different areas. So, for example, I see maybe one of the, the most well-dressed would be probably those with the sailor, the sailor uniform kind of style. I saw them posting and advertising and so forth. And, of course, I'm a human being, and I look at the television, I pass around, and I see those, those notice boards and so forth. So, I am not immune to them. I am also exposed to it. Yeah. And that's just a reality. But generally speaking, the, the dress code for those activities are not wholesome kind of modest dress. And that's the truth. Because you are also in those, in those times, you are seeking to bring out a certain behavior in the people. And music itself has the power to cause persons to behave even how they do not want to behave. And then you add alcohol to that. And substance use and abuse. And so you find an individual who is not always cognizant of what they are doing. 
but they do it because they are under the influence of. That is why when somebody is drinking and driving, they can be charged because they're driving under the influence of alcohol. And the, the medical professionals would have proven that driving under the influence of alcohol is detrimental to the driver and every other driver and those who use the road when you are on the road. Yes, sure. So if it is wrong, even with driving, because it alters, it alters your, your normal state of mind, yeah. then it also is wrong when it comes to revelry and reveling because it alters your normal state of mind. So sure. that same person that is well-dressed, looking so nice and diplomatic, is the same person that you see on the street like, you wonder what is wrong with that same person. True. Is there something wrong with the principles that they uphold mentally? So to me, you cannot just say, an individual cannot say, this is culture. And because I use the word culture, it means that it opens the way and the avenue for there to be a breakdown in principle. So that I can do what I want as I feel. Mm -hmm. So I'm out there jumping, gyrating, enjoying myself and uh, the, the clothes is less. It is revealing. The more you could reveal, the better for you. Yeah. Wet fat. The more you could reveal. Why do you think it's wet? You think it's wet because they want to be wet? They want to be wet because they want it to reveal. Yeah. And why do you want to reveal? It is, it is natural that men, for example, they turn down by what they see. True, true. And so if men are turned down by what they see, and those kinds of settings, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, those kinds of settings, they bring in... The, the, the dress code is dress less. Mm -hmm. The less you dress, the best. Yes, yeah. That's who look good, those who dress less. If those two come together and that is what we see, then how can we call that wholesome and healthy? Yeah. How can a Christian who is supposed to shine a light every day, daily living, daily sacrificing and dying to self, allowing Christ to shine through you, how can I be a true Christian? And demonstrate and depict that kind of behavior when they use the word. They just use the word, it's culture. Yeah. And, and culture, that word just makes the difference. Mash up principle, mash, yeah. mash up law, mash up morality. Something must be wrong with yes. that. And Pastor, I just want to finish the, one of the texts that you, you have you read in um, Galatians chapter 5. And I'll read uh, verse 21. The Bible says it talks about those um, type of behavior that are not um, Christian-like or that what God is displeasing. It says here in Galatians Chapter 5, verses 21, it says, Envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelry, and the like. So everything in, in, as it relates to revelry and what, what is associated with it, of which I told you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice, and the, we are not judging anybody, but the Bible is telling us here that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, God loves everybody. You understand? And God keep put place guidelines so that so that his people, so that anybody can follow his principles to be saved. But if since God has laid it down for you, what you should do and what you should not do, if you continue in your ways, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what the text is saying here. A murderer cannot go in heaven, a murderer. He has to be transformed. But in order for him to be transformed or he or she to be transformed, they must experience the transforming power of God even to this. So we thank you, pastors, for, yes. for, and, for, and what, for what I like. What I like at the end of the day, even though we may not or others may not appreciate the, the discussion or the truth, at the end of the day, as you mentioned there, God, mm -hmm. if you would not inherit the kingdom, that's not, that's not me deciding who inherits the kingdom, you know. That's the word of God yep. that we are guided by. That's the rule of faith and practice, as was mentioned by Pastor George at mm -hmm. the beginning. If this is a rule of faith and practice for the Christian, and Christianity, we're not speaking about a denomination now, mm -hmm. but we're speaking about those who, oh, those who uphold the principles of God, uphold the principles of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So if we call ourselves Christians, and the Bible says... That such behavior, those who engage therein, will not yeah. enter or receive the reward of heaven. Then that is not me giving my opinion on no. the subject. That is not George giving his thought on the matter. That is the word of God speaking. And what we expect persons to do with love in your heart. 
Come on, do what God expects of you. Exactly. Thank Amen. you so much, yes, Pastor Lyons. Pastor George, hold on. Thank you so much. We are, we, are, we, are, we are having a wonderful time here this morning. And I just want to remind you to, um, to also like and share the page so that others can be a part of the discussion this morning. It's a lively one. It is one that is relevant. Um, and we are here to share information, not just our mental information or things that we have in our mind, but also, as Pastor George alluded to earlier, we go in the Word of God and demonstrate and explain and show to you that it is not just our thoughts, but it's what God expects from us as his people. Pastor George, and then we move on. Yes, I just want to reiterate that we, we are here every week on Pastor's Corner mm -hmm, yes. to address certain subjects, certain um, well, topics, um, subjects of discussion. And we are not here to condemn anybody. Yeah. That's not our purpose. We are pastors, um, spiritual leaders, ministers of the gospel, and our every t intention is to help people get to a saving relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so when we address matters like today, reverie, we are reading from scripture, and scripture still causes us to godly living. So yes, those who even after this discussion, continues in a lifestyle contrary to what God expects of them, God will deal with that. Yeah. And I will not apologize for that statement. God will deal with that. But for the one who understands God call on their life to live godly, yeah. God will honor them. And we cannot, we cannot take two ways about that. That is what it is. Amen. And Thank you so pass, much. Thank pass, you so much. We can't miss that point mm -hmm. that in this time, these times here, there is a reason why hospital staff mm -hmm. on standby and the on call. There is yeah. a reason why. Because there is a lot of chopping and sometimes we have killing yes. and a lot of incidents and accidents taking place around this festive season. Yes. And there is a reason why it is heightened around the season and the same reason of substance use and abuse. abuse. Yes. And when the, the natural state of mind is altered, it causes persons, as was mentioned before, to behave and to act a certain way. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that as Christians, we have to be mindful of the time in which we live. Yeah. And let us give ourselves over to God so that God can use us because it would be a sad reality for someone to hear what is being discussed today, hear the truth of God's word. And to die in that kind of practice. Mm -hmm, yes. One thing I can say is to die in sin. And sin is, is doing what goes contrary to God's word. Yeah. If you die doing what is contrary to God's word. Then based on the authority of God's word. You are not looking towards heaven at last. Mm -hmm. But you will be considered a lost soul according to the word of God. Yeah. So as Pastor George mentioned. I believe we have to underscore this. That persons must accept. We must accept. If I'm wrong, I accept. This, is, this, this, is go, this goes contrary to God. Mm -hmm. And when the Spirit of God speaks to us, our response should be, Lord, save me. Amen. And help me to do what is right and pleasing in your sight. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lyons. Um, our next question goes like this. It says, what should be the Christian's approach to culture that involves some sort of reveling? What should be the Christian's role in carnival? Lord, just repeat. And what should be the Christian's approach to culture that involves some sort of reveling? And what should be the Christian's role in carnival? Pastor George, I'll start with you and then I'll go to Pastor Lance. Okay. Um, God has one culture. Mm -hmm. God has one culture. And that is Christian living. That is God's culture. And any culture that goes contrary to that, the Christian should run from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to be a Christian is really someone who, whose behavior and heart reflects Jesus Christ. Christian, to be like Christ. That is what it is. And when we look at our scripture, Acts 11, there we find um, the first instance where people um, were called Christians. Yeah. First at Antioch. And they were called Christians because their speech and their behavior were like Christ. Yes. Their speech and their behavior were like Christ. So, um, you would not find Christ reveling. You would not. You would not find him in carnival. Mm -hmm. Because Christ-like behavior does not entail that. 
True. You would not find him there. He would not be there participating. Um, because that's not his culture. True, yes. That's not his culture. His culture has to do with temperance and, and um, fearing God, giving glory to God in words and, and thoughts and deeds. So, in the same way, the Christian cannot have a role in carnival. Okay. Cannot. <laughs> and um, if I'm to say the Christian has a specific role during carnival time, when carnival is playing, Monday and Tuesday, yeah, it is to stay home, stay somewhere outside of the realms of carnival. You know, you, you have no business in the streets, yeah. in the band. Um, if I'm to say the Christian has a specific role um, during carnival time, during carnival time, and that includes all now, yeah. during carnival time, the Christian should pray. That should be the Christian role during carnival time. So all now, the Christian should be praying, not planning for, um, what's the other one I saw at the, the barber shop the other day? Um, the big white? Okay. Something so. <laughs> not planning for that. The, the, Christian, the Christian should should pray. Pray that God shows grace to his people. Yes. Pray that in spite of the revelry, God preserves lives because during carnival time, we have choppings, we have we have stabbings. We have all sorts of things. Um, preserve the lives of men and women um, in the nation. And very importantly, pray that, that they come to, to a loving relationship with God. The Christian should take every opportunity to point others to what God says in his word mm -hmm. about godly behavior. During, during carnival time, that is why we have this, this relevant um, discussion this morning. Yes. You know, to point others to what God expects of them in behavior. And we do so, as we are doing now, with some tact. Yes. So we are not condemning people. Mm -hmm. We are addressing the matter with some tact. And um, so that persons who need to that get to that place where they understand godly behavior and do so would, would find help. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor George. Um, friends and uh, viewers, we are so happy that you are on this morning. But at this time, we'll just go have a special music in song, and then we'll come back to continue our wonderful discussion.
Thank you all online viewers. We thank you. We are back again. We talk El we thank Ellen Noel for that lovely rendition of song. And I pray that you are you are tremendously blessed as well. We thank you as well for joining us again. And we just want to let you to I remind you to invite your friend and send a, a request for them and let them know that Pastor's Connor is on. And we have a wonderful um topic that we are discussing this morning. And I know that you have been enjoying yourself. And I know Pastor Lyons, Pastor George, and even myself, we are also enjoying ourselves this morning. And Pastor Lyons, can you please comment on a good passage of Scripture? And our passage is good passage. And it is taken from um, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. And I'll read in your hearing, 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. The Bible says, And will receive the wages of unrighteousness, as those who count it pleasure to caress in the daytime. Uh, they, they are spot sorry of blem and blemishes, caressing in their own deception while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. Uh, they have a heart trained in covetous practices and are a cursed children. Ella, that is a strong text. Mm -hmm. And verse 15 oh says, goodness. which have forsaken the right way mm -hmm. and are gone astray following the way of Balaam. Mm -hmm. And I just end here. Well, it says, who love the wages of unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what was just expressed here? Well, of course, at the, at the beginning, we, we also have warning against false teachers yes and uh, those who engage in unrighteous behavior and uh, leading persons astray yes and uh, you know at times we can use the word of god to our own defense true yes in other words i believe that i am right on a matter and I find text to prove, text proofing, to prove that what I am saying is right. But it doesn't mean that the context of the text is what applies to what I'm doing. Yeah. It doesn't make what I am doing right. Yes. And so what we have here, if God is able to identify what is taking place here with his false teachers and... Uh, the, the apostle is able to identify what's taking place here with these false teachers. What it tells us is that God is looking on. Amen. And God sees that the way that they are engaging goes against his way. That's why verse 15 says, forsaken the right way. Mm -hmm, and yeah. it expresses unrighteousness. Yeah. And these two thoughts express, they go contrary to the word of God. Because God's way is the right way. Amen. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. It seemeth right. Mm -hmm. It's a delusion. If you want to call it an illusion, it seemeth right. On, but the, but the, the end thereof yeah, are the ways of destruction. And broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that find it. The Bible that says that. Yes. But narrow, straight is the way that lead it to eternal life, and few there be that find it. The Bible says that. So when culture takes precedence over God's word, That's when culture mashes up God's principles, then that goes contrary 
to the right way because the right way is God's way, Amen. which is the Bible. And the minute time I go against that, God sees, God knows. And what the apostle is expressing here also is the fact that if God knows, God sees, then judgment will follow. By God. Wonderful. Thank you, Pastor Lyons. And also, we need to understand that um, it's not when God says something, he means what he says. Mm -hmm. Pastor George read the text in um, earlier on a while ago in Genesis where he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and how God had destroyed them. Um, God had sent warning after warning upon his people. And it's up to us whether to accept God's warning or reject his warning. And Pastor Lyons alluded to the righteousness and to the unrighteousness. God always gives us a choice. And we are encouraging us today to make the right choice to follow Jesus. When it comes to culture and the word of God, the word of God supersedes all culture. The word of God supersedes, even as a pastor, my opinion, God's word supersedes everything. So friends of mine, we encourage you this morning to stick to the word of God. Mm -hmm. um, pastor George, I have a good question for you. You, know. you may think it's a hard question, but I think it's a good question. It says, um, according to Exodus 32, uh, 5 and 6. Aaron proclaimed a feast to the Lord, which the people enjoyed greatly. Uh, shouldn't that be considered acce an acceptable practice? It says, according to Exodus 32, 5 and 6, Aaron proclaimed, made a feast rather, for the children of Israel, and they, and they enjoyed it greatly. Um, shouldn't that be considered an acceptable practice? And I'll just read um, the two um, verses for us this morning. Um, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says, So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And then, they, then they rose early the next day, offered burnt offering, and brought peace offering. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Okay. Um, Pastor Francis, allow me to just read the text. Um, in a specific context. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pastor. And to do that, I'll read the preceding few verses. Exodus 20, 32, and I'll take it from 1 to 6. I'm reading from the New International Version. If you have your Bible, you can follow. It says, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow, Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. Aaron should be God's man. Mm -hmm. Verse 3 says, so all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol. He made it into an idol, mm -hmm. casting the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are gods. These are your gods, Israel. So Aaron makes an image with the jewelry that they brought. Mm -hmm. Yes, and these Israelites, these permit me to say these ungrateful Israelites, they look at this image and this is their statement. They said, "These are your gods, Israel, who brought you, who brought you up out of Egypt." And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf, and announced, "Tomorrow there will be a feast to the Lord." So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Let me just make this point one time. Truth and error doesn't mix. It doesn't mix. It's like oil and water. It doesn't mix. And when we look at this specific account, the we're breaking the first two commandments. That is, the word of God says it clearly. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image 
or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above mm -hmm. or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. They broke God's command. Mm -hmm. And now, secondly, they have been ungrateful. And they, they are giving worship and obedience that God deserves yeah. to something that man created. And when you look at the account, I mean, time is limited this morning, but we must, we must make it clear. There are some sad verses in scripture. Sad verses. You know, God, dro God drove out men from the, from the garden. That's sad. God had to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah people. That's sad. And then Israel, with a good knowledge of what God had done for them, now ascribes Godship to man-made things. You know, that is a sad scripture. But when we look at the account, it says that though something may be acceptable to society and they may put a religious twist on it, that doesn't make it godly. And so we look at many feasts today where people like Aaron put uh, an altar in front of the feast, you know, and may invite a minister to do the opening prayer. But that is not a godly thing. And, and we, we know what I'm speaking about. Many feasts all around. But we, when we look at the scripture, it says that Aaron tried to, to include things that Moses did to somehow make this feast right. a, a godly event. Yeah. So this is what he did. Um, allow me to share quickly. He built an altar for the purpose of covenant affirmation and ceremony. Just as Moses had done before. He, 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 he made a proclamation concerning a festival and its implementation the following day. That is identical to what Moses had done before. And so, yes, at that feast, they did some, some identical stuff that they had history with God. But they tried to obey God on their own terms. And I want, this, I want us to get this this morning. They used stuff that were identical with their history with God. But on this occasion, they were trying to obey God on their own terms. And that is the problem with the world today. People are trying to, quote unquote, worship God on their own terms. Okay. I will work, I will work in the ministry. From 8 to 4, Monday to Friday. Well dressed. But when carnival time comes, I roam the street almost naked. And if it happens that I participate in some lasciviousness um, over, the, over the course of time, I go pray to a man. And you know, it'll be all right. That is trying to worship God on your own terms. And God is not pleased with that. Thank you God so much. is not pleased with that. And, and thank you so much. Hold on, Pastor. Thank you so much, Pastor George. I, I like how you hit today. Um, and we, we find that happening, especially in certain occasions where you would have certain things. Um, you would call a minister to pray. But what happens after the prayer does not, does not, does not demonstrate God-like nature. And it does not demonstrate the Christian values. And that is, that is, that is something that, that, that we do here in the Caribbean, Pastor Mm -hmm. Lions, go ahead. Yeah, when we, we look at the, the scripture that was read from 2 Peter 2, 13 and 14, and then we come down to Exodus 32, 5 and 6, the truth is there is, there, in both cases, there is a sense of lasciviousness taking place there, the sexual immorality taking place there and, and practices and behavior mm -hmm. because... As was mentioned before, when this feasting is taking place, it's not, it's not a, no, 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 holiness are taking place here. No, you, know. you do it in the name of yeah. holiness, but doing it in the name of does not make it holy. of God. Yeah. It does not make it holy. And that's why the Bible could say, Matthew 59, in vain do they worship. So if, if the Bible can express the thought, you can worship in vain, then... That is actually possible. Mm -hmm. You can actually be worshiping, doing mm -hmm. something that you think is right. And I think that's the principle we're working with here with now. You think it is right, 
But in the eyes of God, it is wrong because you are violating biblical principles. And that is what we see consistently taking place here with our topic and the text that we would have expressed and read, like seriousness and, yeah. and the revelry and the, the reveling. These are all against mm -hmm. the, the practice of what God expects of us based on the accounts from the word of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Lyons. Uh, this time we'll go to our final question. It says, finally, what does Ellen White says, or what does she have to say regarding reveling? What does Ellen White have to inform us as it relates to reveling? It says, please share a quote from her writings. All right. Well, let me, is it okay if I do this differently? Go ahead, Ella, instead go ahead. Of, instead of a quotation where she says, don't engage in revelry. Let me take it differently. In Daniel and the Revelation, mm -hmm. expressing the thought, Ellen White, it says, while Belshazzar was indulging in his presumptuous revelry, while the angel's hand was tracing the doom of the empire of the walls of the palace. While Daniel was making known the fearful import of the heavenly writing, the Persian soldier, soldiery, through the emptied channel of the Euphrates, had made their way into the heart of the city mm -hmm. and was speeding forward with drawn swords to the palace of the king. Scarcely can it be said that they surprised him, for God had just forewarned him mm -hmm. of his doom. But they found him and slew him, and with him the empire of Babylon ceased yeah. to be. So, not just an expression of the thought that says, don't do it. Yeah. But a practical example mm -hmm. where he was forewarned yep. of his behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ellen White expresses his thought. When you look at the, the context, and you look at the story, and it's real, because... That story falls into the image mm -hmm. with the head of gold and then yeah. with silver. And then you see that's where the, the breakdown started to take place. Every element after the head of gold yeah. was a more inferior yeah. element to the one that came before. And so it was the same practice that Belshazzar was engaging in. As a matter of fact, the brother took the golden vessels mm -hmm. from that was supposed to be for the house of God. God yeah. And they started to praise the God of gold and of silver. And they were, they were enjoying themselves. As a matter of fact, he was drinking too. Yeah. And at the beginning of our discussion, we spoke about revelry. And we associated it based on the definition with a lot oh, of yeah. alcohol consumption. Yeah, no. And so he was consuming a lot of alcohol. But the point I still want to underscore is the part that he was forewarned. So he was, he was engaging in it. And he was forewarned. And he did not take the warning. They continued. Yeah. And his destruction and downfall came at the end of the day. So what I'm seeing here, Ellen White expressing the thought in this practical story that yet again, as was expressed before, God is looking on. God sees. He knows. And God is going to step in. We don't know when God will step in. Yeah. But before God step in, the best thing to do, instead of allowing judgment, the hand of God of judgment to fall on you, God is a God of love and mercy, and he's just, but he gives a reward based on our actions. So if God says, don't do it, be careful, yeah. because you don't want the weight of God's judgment to fall upon you. And woe unto the one who dies in sin. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lanz. And just so I'm piggyback on what you just read. And even when Belshazzar knew the relationship with his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, and what the judgment that God did, or passed upon his grandfather. So he had an idea, he had a knowledge of the truth because of his grandfather's experience. And similarly, we are saying here today that with the information that you are being received, what you are receiving today, serves as an encouragement to you to choose Jesus and serve as a warning to you that if you do not choose Jesus and his principles, then you will have to suffer the consequence. Pastor George. Yes, Pastor. Um, I have a few quotations that i like to share. I take the first one from the Great Controversy, chapter 6, The Impending Conflict. It says, and I wish that we would listen to these quotations. They are clear. It says, I quote, Wherever the divine precepts are rejected, 
sin ceases to appear sinful or righteousness desirable. Those who refuse to submit to the government of God are wholly unfitted to govern themselves. Through their pernicious teachings, the spirit of insubordination is implanted in the hearts of children and youth who are naturally impatient of control and a lawless, licentious society, state of society results. While scoffing at the cruelty of those who obey the requirements of God, the multitudes eagerly accept the delusions of Satan. They give the rein to loss and practice the sins which have called down judgments upon the heathen. I also quote, through the two great errors, through the two great errors, number one, the morality of the soul, and number two, the Sunday sacredness, two great errors. Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. There are two great errors in our society today. And I want us to get that. Number one, that immorality of the soul is acceptable. It is okay to be immoral. And that, that goes in many spheres. Man and man, woman and woman, revelry where God's temple is exposed. And it shouldn't be. And secondly, the idea of Sunday sacredness. Those are the two greatest deceptions that the enemy is running down God's people with today. And I want us to take note of that. Immorality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. And I also want to share with us um, from a call to stand apart. It says, it is true that some may see their folly and repent. So some persons listening today would understand, but this is not a godly thing. And repent. God may pardon them. But they have wounded their own souls and brought upon themselves a lifelong peril. There, there are consequences for every action. Yeah. But God gives grace. The power of discernment, which ought ever to be kept keen and sensitive to distinguish between right and wrong, is in a great measure destroyed. They are not quick to recognize the guiding voice of the Holy Spirit or discern the devices of Satan. Too often in time of danger, they fall under the temptation and are led away from God. The end of their pleasure-loving life. The end of folks who choose a pleasure-loving life as more important than God is ruin for this world and for the world to come. But there is hope this morning. And so I share this last quotation. It says, the garden of the heart must be cultivated. The soil must be broken up by deep repentance for sin. Poisonous satanic plants must be uprooted. The soil, once overgrown by thorns, can be reclaimed only by diligent labor through prayer, through study of God's word. So the evil tendencies of the natural heart can be overcome only by earnest effort in the name and strength of Jesus. The Lord bids us by his prophet, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. We have Jeremiah 4, verse 3. We have Hosea 10, verse 12. This work he desires to accomplish for us. And he asks us to cooperate with him. Amen. So God desires to save all of us. Whether you have been at a place where revelry and partying and carnival seem attractive. Or whether you have never been there. God wants to do a great work for all of us. But he desires that we cooperate with him. Amen. Thank you so much. And finally, the Bible says in Philippians 4, verse 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any pr anything praiseworthy, meditate on those things. Brothers and sisters, or friends of mine, or online viewers, we thank you for being a part of our discussion this morning. We hope that you have learned something, and by the grace of God, that we will put into practice. 
I want us to be encouraged to accept Jesus, put away the carnival behavior, and surrender our lives to Jesus. At this time, I'll now ask Pastor Lyon to just give us our closing prayer. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Almighty Father and God, we say thank you for the discussion we had today. We say thank you for the awareness we were able to bring to the lives and the minds of those that were listening and those that will listen in future time. Father, we know we are living in dangerous times. Times when our minds, the control of the, the mind is most important to the enemy. And so we pray even as the word expresses, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We ask, dear God, that we are going to allow this scripture to be manifested and proclaimed in our every moment and in our every deliberation that we engage in as Christians. We pray that we are going to go into the school of Christ and every habit and behavior, every practice that goes contrary to loyalty to God and to the principles of his word will be denied, denounced, and removed from our lives so that we are not going to stand against Christ but we are going to stand with Christ every step of the way, proclaiming to the world that we are children of God and not children of the world. We pray that the influence of music that goes contrary to your rule and practice from the world and even the consumption of substances that would cause abuse and damage to our bodies and seek to all to our state of mind, they would not be part of our practice, dear Father, but we'll go, we will stand against that and we will allow you to be the driving force and the center of our rule and practice in faith. So take our lives, dear God, and even, Father, those who are going to defy and disobey you in these festive times, we still ask that your hand of mercy, dear God, will still be therein because we know that there is still somebody to be saved. And so, Lord, have mercy where you can and may your grace, dear God, still look over. And so we say thank you for your love, thank you for your blessings, and thank you for this discussion. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Lyons, and do have a wonderful, wonderful week.